first world order radio finally finally we are on the air no doubt all right all right there's always gonna be somebody in the building on first world order radio begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. And others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories. Shit that works. All right, all right. So you already know what we talk about tonight. We're going to deal with the holy orgasm too. Sex science healing arts, and regeneration, which is a little spinoff of um, what we just dropped this past Sunday um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So um, for those who missed it, um, you get a chance to um, get a little summary. And um, these lectures eventually will lead to a whole book. So you get a chance in order to get into that also um, before it comes out. So um, we're going to get into it. The whole science of sex is the science of duality um, based on um, that duality coming together and complementarying each other, a complement each other. Now, the science is the Kundalini energy. That is the all-pervasive energy of the universe. As a matter of fact, we are a concentration of that force in miniature form. All right, so we like the microcosm of the macrocosm, which is the universe itself. As a matter of fact, the universe was produced from out of the Kundalini or Prana Kundalini energy. All right, so when we explore sex and our sexuality, we'll be attempting to tap into and open and activate more than just 10% of that life force energy within us. All right, that is the whole purpose of actually coming together is to um, tap into that other 90%, which is dormant, or in which that lies um, half asleep, as they say. The Kundalini is, is um, three and a half times you at the base of the spine. So through the sexual act, through the bumping and grinding, through that friction, what happens is that um, that energy becomes activated over a course of time. Okay, that's one of the sciences to that. Now, this energy has two aspects, which that we talk about duality. One manifests the worldly existence, and the other leads to leads us to the higher or the highest truth. All right. So the mundane aspect of this energy functions perfectly at ten percent. So most of us have about ten percent activation of this energy within us, which gives us the ability to see, touch, taste, smell, and hear. 
but the inner aspect is dormant, sleeping, all right, which is about 90%. But when this inner kundalini is awakened, it leads us to the state of self. Now, the kundalini is the inner female soul of man that is all set, all right? So kundalini shakti is all set, all right? And the kundalini shiva is all saw. And when they come together, they produce Krishna, which is Hiru. All right, this is how these stories, now, that was Sanskrit and also ancient Egyptian. They are both identical. That is also spoken of within the Bible as the divine marriage in heaven. Christ and his, um, who is the bridegroom, and the bride being said, um, the church or the body of Christ, as they would say. All of that is talking about that same concept. So this is why there's nothing more important than the knowledge of the Kundalini. There's no knowledge more important than that, all right, because you don't have a soul. You are a soul, and you have a body. So there's a difference in perception there, all right? So when you get into the higher sciences, you'll find out that not only is your kundalini is 90% dormant, but your DNA is 90% dormant. The scientists say that we only use 10% of our brain, so the other 90% of our brain is dormant. Scientists also say that they only are able to see 10% of the visible universe. The other 90% is invisible, all right? So um, that is some of the science in which that is going on. Now, another interesting thing is that if you take a um, normal um, electrical light bulb, it gives off about 10% of its energy as light, while 90% of it, um, of the energy is wasted as energy. Well, your physical body is the same way. 90% heat um, of your body escapes at the top of the head. And it's no coincidence that your brain is about 90% water. So in the same manner, only 10% of the body's energy is stored. Now, that's unlike a firefly. The reason why a firefly is able to light up or what is called a lightning bug is able to light up is because it stores 90% of the heat. All right, so it's able to transform heat into light and only waste 10% of it is heat. So we have to change that. Once again, 90% of the heat of our body escapes at the top of the head. All right? And so in the same manner, only 10% of the body's energy is stored. But that's unlike the lightning bug or the um, firefly, in which that is directly opposite. It stores 90% of the heat transforming or transferring the heat into light and only wastes 10% of the heat. All right? So how do we um, do the same thing that a firefly does? or the, um, you know, lightning bug does in that sense and cause us to light up, you know. Well, instead of letting the energy escape at the top of the head, you would draw energy in at the top of the head and store that energy into the three areas of your body called the three treasures, all right, or which that, or your dantians, your lower dantian, which is your navel chakra about an inch or two below, the back of the heart, your mid, Dantian and your upper Dantian, which is the third eye. In the Bible, they call it the upper room. This is where Jesus breathed unto his disciples the may, and um, and um, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Only that is symbolic from the breath of life um, coming from the head area. And the thoughts in which that is projected from via the third eye or the mind's eye. All right, so we have to learn how to draw in energy and store the energy into our body, and this will cause our body to light up similarly to the fire flower, the lightning bug. Otherwise, um, the energy, uh, which is heat, escapes the body and is never transferred into light. All right? So we have to understand what is going on. The pineal gland reduces the production of light Hormone. Melatonin um, 
is from 90% active at night and 10% inactive during the day. And serotonin is about 10% inactive at night and 90% active during the day. All right? So this 90 and 10% activity is there. And we spoke about a little bit earlier how 10% of the DNA is cold and inactive, while 90% of the DNA is non-coded or inactive. That's what is known as your junk, junk DNA. So by storing more light within the body, these things become activated and give us access to the 90% that in our DNA in um, seeing in the universe that is invisible or dark, what is called dark matter, um, being able to store that 90% of light within the body, um, being able to um, do all of these things in which that normally we don't have access to. And the more we do it, the more we become God-like. All right? It's a real simple thing is that um, Frank Barr, he stated that if we was able to, if we was able to um, utilize light properly, we could evolve matter. All right? Now, that's deep, but we'll get to more of that in a second. Now, the... Now, you wonder what all this got to do with sex. Well, that's the whole point of sex is to activate the Kundalini and to be able to bring more light and store light within your body. All right? That is the regenerative process. What they taught us is just a reproductive process, but we know that every time that we have sex, we don't have children. So is that something in which that you shouldn't even listen to, as if that's the only analysis of sex, is to have children, and it's not. Obviously, otherwise, we'll have children every time we go and have sex. And, of course, we know that a woman can only have sex once every um, nine, ten months, or, well, ten months or so. All right? So um, even if he was popping them out back to back, you know, these guys and goddesses out back to back like that, um, there still is a waiting period, you know, for the woman in that regard. You know, so... Um, we know that there has to be another quality or quantity to sex itself, and that is um, regeneration, all right? Um, If you go to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, the first through the second verse, it talks about Melchizedek, the king of Salaam, who um, Abraham gave a tenth of all that he had to um, Melchizedek. Obviously, Melchizedek symbolized the 90%. So when the 90% come in contact with the 10%, then, of course, that's 100%. Well, that goes back to what we said a little bit earlier, that scientists claim that only that um, human beings only use 10% of their brain. Now the 90% is dormant. All right? So um, that means the other remains un, uh, undeveloped or unconscious. So um, a master used the undeveloped sense receptors and brain centers or brain cells. So the subconscious mind functions and operates on the astral plane of existence. So since the um, consciousness, you know, or the voluntary mind is considered to express only one-tenth of the total mind power, then the subconscious, which is the involuntary mind, must represent the other nine-tenths. All right, and of course, we know that the subconscious mind taps into the superconscious, superconscious and the magnetic conscious, and magnetic conscious into infinite consciousness. Right. Therefore, only nine-tenths can surely account for the mind's vast ability to reach far beyond the physical plane of existence, which operates partially under the control of the conscious mind, right, which is the 10% utilized. So for the astral plane, um, it's composed of what we call thought. You know, So um, you can't disregard or ignore the facts of astrology, which is the study of the stars, the word astral means star, all right? Um, of the astrological energies on the astral body or star body. Because quantum physics, um, scientists say that the human body is composed of stardust particles and over 300,000 tons of stardust particles of energy or photonic energy, electromagnetic energy, force the planet Earth daily. And as melanated beings, our melanocytes um, act as black holes to absorb this energy as well as all of the various spectrum of light. 
and these storage places that we talked about, you know, via our melanin is used to um, contain this energy in order to be used for a later time if we choose to. All right, so that is um, some of the science. Now, the Kundalini is basically given a description. If you go to, like, Revelation, the fifth chapter, and it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. All right, the book written within, of course, is the book of life, which, of course, is your DNA. And DNA has a backbone. All right, and your backbone, you know, of the DNA also symbolizes the backbone of your physical body, which is your digiti, which is the backbone of Osiris. And it says um, a throne, um, the throne, a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. So on the back side of the book written within was sealed with seven seals. Of course, those are the seven chakras. The back side actually is the um, sacral nerve or sacral bone area right above the craft you're behind was that the Kundalini energy resonate at. You know, that is the special bowl for the Kundalini. You know, it, it dwells um, from head to toe, you know, um, as the physical body and 76 trillion cells. Um, its special bowl is right there at the base of the spine. And so um, the 33 vertebrates come up from out of there, and those two um, nerves called your sacral nerves or the Eda and the Pingala, crisscross each other up the spine. But there's 31 um, pairs of nerves inside of the spinal column. Okay? And what happens is that that energy, um, as it moves up through what's called the hollow area in the back, the Shishuna, um, it brings forth um, electrical magnetic energy um, through those particular nerves in which that expands out to the various organs and endocrine gland of the body. So that means that the energy in which that you raise up um, has a tendency of being able to restore efficient um, areas within the body, within the glands and within the organs, et cetera. But this is why it becomes essential in order to master these energies. All right? And sex is a heavy responsibility, as a matter of fact. Um, when you have sex with someone, that is marriage. And this is what this is the problem with society is not, that's not being taught, you know. But that's what it is. When you have sex with someone, you are married to them. The word sex um, definition means to merge. And the word merge is the root word of the word marriage, which is marriage. All right, so marriage, marriage, or merge, and sex are talking about the same thing, essentially. All right, it's a known fact that the sperm travels up the base of the spine through the 33 vertebrates to go, so moving from prostate fluid to spinal fluid into cerebral fluid and get baptized in the river, through the River Jordan in the third ventricle of the brain. In which that they receive the spark of life from the pineal gland. The pineal gland is the master endocrine gland located in the center of the brain. So you have the pineal gland, the hypothalamus gland, the pituitary glands, which comprises what is known as the third eye, all right, which is the spiritual eye. And from a metaphysical perspective, um, it has been no link between the physical and the spiritual world. It functions as a link to prophecy and increased spiritual awareness and consciousness. All right, so this is um, what happens when the energy raises up. Now, there's Kundalini symptoms in which that um, we need to talk about. Now, these Kundalini symptoms, um, right, a lot of it is being ignored socially, you know, and, they are, and the people are ignorant of the multidimensional trans, transformative um, process in which that is taking place, especially right now before these chem, before these um, solar flare activities in which that is taking place. All right, um, this large percentage of people will talk about long bouts of strange illnesses. 
you know, as well as radical, mental, emotional, interpersonal, psychic, um, spiritual, and lifestyle changes. Over and over again, we hear stories of frustrated, sometimes desperate visits to the doctors or healers or counselors, um, and et cetera, who neither understands nor were able to help with the uh, with the problems, you know what I'm saying, raging by the Kundalini, you know. Um, so when you study it, you find, like, um, there's various symptoms, a muscle twitches, cramps, spasms, energy rushes, immense electrical or um, electricity circulating through the body, um, itching, vibrating, prickling, tingling, um, stinging or crawling sensations on the skin, um, intense heat or cold. Um, involuntary body movement. I know a brother who um, used to do Qigong, and at certain times his body would not stop going to various positions. He couldn't control it for several months. All right? I mean, he doesn't do it now, but for for about two, three months straight, um, his body would go into various Qigong positions, and he couldn't control it. All right. Um, oftentimes it occurs during um, meditation, rest or sleep, um, jerking, um, tremors, shaking, feeling an inner force pushing one or two postures and moving one body beyond um, the normal or the norm, you know, in usual ways, unusual ways. So um, it um, disturbs eating and resting patterns or sleeping patterns. Um, episodes of extreme hyperactivity, you know, overwhelming fatigue, intensified or diminished sexual desire, um, headaches, pressures in the skull, you know, racing heartbeat, pains in the chest, um, digestive system problem, numbness or pain in the limbs, particularly the left and um, the left foot and leg, um, pain and blockages anywhere, often in the neck or back, emotional outbursts, you know, um, rapid mood shifts, seemingly unprovoked or um, excessive episodes of grief, fear, rage, or depression, spontaneous vocalization, including laughter and weeping, and unintentional or uncontrollable hicc- um, hiccup. Um, hearing the inner noise or sounds such as flutes, drums, waterfalls, birds, um, singing, bees, buzzing, or you might even hear sounds like roaring or whooshing or thunderous noises or ringing in the ears. You know, um, I've had a few of these symptoms myself. Um, the buzzing in the ears, um, the whooshing noise, you know, all of that. All right. Um, so these are some of the symptoms. All right. Sometimes they get more extreme. People um, have mental confusion, difficulties concentrating and focusing, alter, um, alternated um, states of consciousness, heightened awareness, spontaneous trance state, mystical experiences, you know, which sometimes lead them into the negative direction with psychosis or self grandiosis. All right? Um, in other words, sometimes they think that they're the Messiah or the Christ or whatever the case may be. You know? Um, heat, strange activity, and all blissful sensations in the head, particularly in the crown chakra. Um, ecstasy, bliss, um, intervals of tremendous joy, love, peace, and compassion. All right, normally when that happens, when the Kundalini comes up into the heart area. All right, originally you said that the Kundalini dwelt there. Um, psychic experiences, out-of-body experiences, past life, memory, astral travel, soul travel, contacts with spirit guides through inner voices, dreams of vision, healing powers, increased creativity, 
new interest in self-expression or spiritual communication through music, art, poetry, etc. You know, enlightenment experiences, direct knowing of a more expansive reality, transcendent awareness, intensified understanding and sensitivity, insight, you know, into one's own essence, deep understanding of spiritual truths. So all of these are symptoms. Now, let me explain. You must have an, another outlet, hobbies, you know, such as um, art, poetry, you know, even if something as simple as um, exercising, walking, prayer, you know, reading, spiritual books, you know, um, these things help because they give you an alternative, you know, um, and it teaches you how to use that creative kundalini energy in other ways in which they are not destructive. All right, it's a known fact that um, meditation and sex have, um, have things in common. You know, um, it offers, as a matter of fact, it offers the same effect on the brain. As it turned out, um, there was an article done by Scientific American magazine in which that talked about neurobiology of bliss, sacred or profane, in which they did a study in which that um, O'Brien stated, one of the researchers, that people meditating and having an orgasm both experience um, high levels of self-awareness you know, alterations in bodily perception and decrease sense of pain. When you meditate, the left side of your brain lights up. When you have sex, the right side of the brain lights up, all right? You know, why is that a good thing? Because both experiences synergizes the hemispheres of the brain, in which that causes the dendrites and the synapses to fire off between the two, in which that causes both brains to work together instead of separate. In other words, it makes a person more holistic in their views instead of fragmented. All right, so um, these are the sciences on on that also. Now, that leads up into meditation, sex, and the mind or the brain. That leads to sex magic which has a aspect of Tantra Kriya Yoga. Um, a lot of that was brought to us by Pascal Beverly Randolph, an occultist from the um, 1800s. But um, basically what sex magic means is basically is using your sexuality in order to work magic. Um, you know, these techniques, you know, is not new nor outrageous. Um, but usually it was kept secret by many esoteric systems. I'm um, using sexuality for spiritual and magical aims. You know, for example, um, you had witchcraft or shamanism, alchemy, the Buddhist and the um, Hindu Tantra and the um, ancient Egyptian religion. They all have used it and probably more known uh, for the Sex magic is the ceremonial sexual union of man and woman on the land to um, ensure a good crop, all right? This is shown even in the scriptures, in the Bible particularly. You know, therefore, you know, fertility act um, should encourage the land to develop a rich harvest. You know, that that was what they, um, that's where that somewhat came from. Now, in Western sex magic, it has its roots in the Hebrew Kabbalah, and it spread it um, forth through the several, several occult doctrines like the Knights Templars, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, etc., Golden Dawn, ATO, um, OTO, um, the AA, you know, Astoria, etc. Nowadays, sex magic is a beautiful way of giving sex back to the rightful place of sacred sexuality. Now, it is a firm invitation to leave the trail of the sneaky um, hidden in the dark and sinful sex most of us have grown up with. All right, it actually is a call to stop fighting um, this most powerful human force and make use of the possibilities. 
All right, since sexuality is a gift from God to goddess, it has to be divine. So within an open and respected sexual relationship, we can experience ourselves in all our aspects, all right, the human part, the divine flame within, you know. So thus the um, man-god is connected, you know, or the woman-goddess is connected. So during the sexual arousal, an enormous amount of energy is channeled upwards from the genitals, you know, along the spine to the top of the head. And it's there in which that the thought is projected outward. And if the man and woman both have the same thought, especially at the point of orgasm, they can both um, get to the point of orgasm around the exact same time, the thought in which that is released will oftentimes manifest. That's why you have to be careful of your thoughts during the sexual act. So on its way up, the energy fills and cleanses blockages in the chakras caused by emotional or psychological wounds, all right? This explains why several spiritual paths view sexual yoga as a shortcut to enlightenment, and actually is the, what the quickest way to spiritual enlightenment is through tantra kriya yoga. Now, during that time period, when you practice sex magic, I recommend that you use the energy in order to protect and heal. Those are the keys, protection and healing. All right, in particular, healing, because that's the reason why you will have sex, as we played earlier, sexual healing, more than gay, is to keep yourself healthy. As a matter of fact, the various positions help with that process. All right, we gave an example before of the woman riding on top of the man, and he moved up, moving underneath her. What happens is that if there's an energy blockage within his heart, it is removed. Or for the woman... Um, there's energy blocked in her um, heart chakra, then the doggy style position would be utilized in that regard. All right? So even the sexual positions help with relieving um, these negative patterns and blockages in the chakras or in the endocrine gland. In other words, it helps with um, the free flow of these hormones in perfect balance with one another, which is my yacht. All right, so these are some of the keys. These are some of the things in which that you um, didn't get a chance to um, get to see in the lecture, and that's why I'm doing this part also. All right? And as we were talking about Beverly Pastor Randolph, um, he celebrated his sexual union as a metaphysical and holy ritual, and that's what it is. Only when it produces full and complete orgasm for both parties. This is what he said, it, and I agree with him. This place in a conflict with um, a lot of the theories of traditional Hindu tantra, um, who holds that the male orgasm um, expands rather than enhance um, the male sexual energy. You know what I'm saying? And the science is, is that in Tantra, um, you circulate the energy through rejuvenation principles through what is known as the holdback technique, all right? Um, the man has several holdback techniques, um, 10 of them, all right? He has about 10 holdback techniques. Um, if you get the book by Stephen Chang, he speaks about um, the holdback technique, and we say he's called the nine-stroke technique, in which that you start out with eight. Um, shallow strokes and one deep thrust. Um, then um, um, seven shallow strokes and two deep thrusts. And then once again, um, shallow um, seven shallow strokes, two deep thrusts. And then three, six shallow strokes, three deep thrusts. Then six shallow, three, then six shallow, three deep thrusts again. Four. Um, five shallow strokes, four deep thrusts, and you do that, you know, um, five times. And so until you get to um, eventually nine deep thrusts, nine times. Now, through all of that, the man has to practice what is known as the whole back technique in which that he'll get to about 90-some-odd percent 
of the orgasm, and what he would do is pull up his anal and perineal muscle, in which that, by doing so, um, he would basically um, rejuvenate himself, and he would circulate that energy seven times in the process. As he pulls up, he'll visualize the energy coming up the spine over top of the head, all right, in a circular manner of the spine again, over top of the head, down the front, to the perineum, up again, and he would do that seven times and then get back into um, those techniques again. So after his first hold back technique, he strengthens and energizes his body. He do it the second time, he strengthens that ears and the eyes. The third time, he strengthens the immune system and increases the body's own resistance and retards the aging process. Four, he strengthens the energize the internal organ. Five, um, he improves the circulatory system and prevents strokes and varicose veins. Six, he energizes the bones to prevent um, arthritis and rheumatism. And even and also any type of senility. All right. Um, seven, he energizes and tones the muscular system. Eight, he develops a strong aura. Nine, he heals all kinds of sickness and diseases and ailments. Ten, the man becomes completely psychic and very spiritual because the pineal gland is now fully activated and energized, all right? So um, doing those stroke techniques of the shallow and the deep thrust, the man would be um, doing the whole back technique and circulating the energy seven times. And then he could ejaculate. So it actually isn't in conflict with what Pastor Beverly Randolph stated. Now, if he was in the Taoist um, sexuality um, and Taoist school, they tell you not to ejaculate but to ejaculate, was that you would feel a rumbling at the base of your spine as the energy goes up, and that is the um, the semen being transformed from prosthetic fluid to cerebral fluid traveling up the spine, which is uh, from the Sea of Galilee into um, the Nile River, you know, into um, or what is also referred to in some esoteric schools as uh, the River Jordan into the cerebral fluid in which that in the third ventricle, and was that the sperm of the chosen Christ will receive the spark of life from God, and that is the Jesus, all right, or the Christ Jesus, in which that is Christian or anointed, in which that comes down, and that's the sperm which has the most light around his head, in and around his head, that produces an aura of this golden ray light. Now, which that is good forth with the 777,777,777 or 76 cells called germs or sperm, in which that, um, as they are good forth into the vaginal canal, um, everyone knows who the Christ is, and their role is actually to protect the Christ from being destroyed and to destroy any of the antibodies and anything else in which that the woman has within her vaginal canal in which that could possibly. Um, destroy um, him in the process. Now, the sperm is very alkaline, while the vaginal fluid is acidic. And it's acidic because um, it's there to destroy antibodies. And the sperm is seen as an antibody, something that is foreign to the woman's body. And that's why so many sperms are produced in order to help with that, um, to rectify that matter. So as these other sperms fight, you know, um, there's a number of 144,000 on which that protects that chosen sperm in order to get him to the egg, the nucleus of the egg, so that his tail can break off and his head, which is the sperm, can blow up to equivalent size of the nucleus of the egg and begin to start going through cellular division to become blastopores. And those same eight cells never die. And those same eight cells um, live within the body of that child, in which that is formed and 
um, shaped and made within the womb or the universe of the woman, all right, through triple stage darkness, as they're called, the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And those are the nine um, periods of life. And that is what is known as triple stage darkness or the triple state of blackness, all right? Uh, dark matter. And life is brought forth through that union. Now, what brings the sperm into being is real simple. Um, the breath, which is the spirit, all right, which is the word. And these are the things in which that brings that into existence. So the more you can breathe, the deeper you can breathe, the more oxygen you can get within your body, the stronger the sperm is. The more your body can manufacture the sperm. So actually, the sperm is the personification of air, called shu. And how we know this because in the mythology of the ancient Egyptian, or is it really mythology? Um, you might see the pictures as being that, but when you get down to what is being said or conveyed, um, it is science. You will see Atum sucking his own penis in which that um, he masturbates by sucking his penis in which that um, upon ejaculation he produced shoe in which that they say he was produced through a sneeze. Well, when you sneeze, you say Yashu. All right? Now, that happens to be the Aramaic name of Yahshua, which is Jesus. So Jesus actually is the sperm, all right, encased in semen, to be drawn forth or to be brought out through the waters of life. Hence Moses, in a sense, in which that Moses within Amos, Amoshus, Amosha, means to be drawn forth from the water, all right? Um, this is why Jesus said, I would teach Andrew and Peter how to be fishermen of men, Symbolic to the sperm once again. Peter symbolic to the father symbol. Andrew um symbolic to um the um the semen. All right. So I mean, these are the things in which that is taking place right in your scriptures. And you know, for the average person, they can't decode it. And this is the reason why we have such a problem with the sexual morality um, because we don't understand what is being. Um, actually conveyed right in front of us. All right, so when you get into the science of um, Adam and Eve, like we've seen in the lecture, is that Adam is not talking about a man because man symbolized the mind or to think, even in what's the dictionary. But man or Adam, in this sense, symbolized the um, sixth Adam on the periodical chart. All right, the sixth atom on the periodical chart. All right, is carbon, and carbon has six um, electrons, six neutrons, six um, protons. You know, so he, him, who has the wisdom of the mark of the beast, six six six. So six 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 just symbolizes the material realm or plane of existence. All right, Jesus is the second atom. All right, so this is what all this is talking about. All right, now, another thing um, put forth was the science that um, not only was Jesus the second Adam, symbolic to um, Atum, and Atum first began a song with Shu, and we broke down um, Shu, that Jesus' Aramaic name is Yahshua, and the sign always that you make when you sneeze is Yashu. So, I mean, all of this is no coincidence. They were telling you that the word um, or the breath of life in which that was breathed into the nostrils of man that made man a living soul is Yahshua. So when Christians say that Jesus Christ um, existed with God, that was true. They knew what they was talking about in that sense. You know, and there's a lot of things in which that they speak about which is true or they have the right concept of can't necessarily explain it all. Of course not. But that's where mystic and occult teachings come in at, or esoteric teachings come in at, metaphysical teachings come in at, is to help explain um, basically all that we possibly can so that science and religion can become one once again. 
and that there was never no separation except for a person's interpretation. All right? But when you look at the eighth element on the parallel chart, that is um, basically oxygen. Now, we talk about oxygen. When we talk about oxygen, let's check this out, yo. <laughs> oxygen has eight protons, eight neutrons, eight electrons. Now, when you go to Alice Crowley, 777, the um, writings of Alice Crowley, he states, or the Kabbalistic writings of Alice Crowley, he states in there that 888 is the numeral or geometrical Kabbalistic number for Jesus Christ. And it is. So this is how we know that the Word was made flesh and how they collated the, um, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. Or Jesus was made flesh. And he was the Word. So hence, I go back once again to what we just finished talking about, the breath of life. So you go and read the Egyptian or Tamarain or Tamarian or Kamal or Kamatan, Metuneter, it specifically states that Shu is the um, means, the um, personification of air. In other words, the breath of life. So it's no coincidence that Yahshua in Aramaic and old, in old Hebrew or Hebrew means, oh, he who saves, or the Lord of my salvation. So it's talking about the breath of life being the Lord of the salvation. Why? Because it's the breath in which that merges the lower self with the higher self and make them one self. So that there's no longer the appearance of duality. The veil has been lifted. All right? This is what is going on, y'all. Seriously. Y'all got to um, overstand this. Y'all really have to overstand this. Because y'all have to learn how to talk to your parents properly and your cousins and your nephews and your aunts and uncles, all of them who are trapped in this, in that mentality before you can get them to see that God dwells within. I had a debate with um, this Christian last week on Facebook. And why? It's because I wanted to. I'm just that type of nigga. All right? And what that meant was real simple is that sometimes you have to spank or make a person think. Because what I notice is that by humiliating a person, you actually make them think. You snap them out of that spell, that spell of Kingle, that spell of of um of Willie Lynch. You snap them out of that. Even if it's for nothing more than a second, you actually make them think. Now, he was coming at me saying that I was confused because he I guess he must have listened to my metaphysical uh, major world religion you know, um, broadcasters that we had on here about a month or so ago. And so he was saying, it seems or appears that you're confused. And, but I never said I was confused, right? Um, we don't want to say you was confused. So since you are confused and you have admitted it, um, let me ask you this. And so we got this little discussion. And he basically told me that he was just going to read the one book, which is the Bible. And so I asked him, I said, so you just going to read that one book? Did you read that one book from kindergarten to the 12th grade? Or from the 12th grade to college for those four years? Or you, you had to get a master's for those two years? Or if you had to get a PhD, you had to do your thesis um, and get the PhD for another year? I mean, did you tell your professors or your teachers who was just going to read that one book? Or did you study your ass off? or A, B, or C, especially in biology class where, they t- where the teacher told you that you come from a monkey. In anthropology class, in history class, in biology class, they say that you come from a monkey. In order to get out of school, you had to pass with A, B, or C, average. In order to hear and be told how good of a monkey you are. Now, I found that strange. Here I am trying to tell you that God is within you and that you come from God, and you debate with me about it. But yet, did you debate with your teachers about your ass coming from a monkey? You see what I'm saying? So this is the bullshit 
you know, that you have to kind of act. And in those cases, I don't mind insulting you in order to make you think, because that's what a teacher does is to spank your ass into consciousness in one shape, form, or fashion. You didn't see the Shaolin monks being nice to their pupils all the time. Sometimes you see them take a stick and whoop that ass. Sometimes that's necessary. Yes, I'd rather not argue, but if times like that, it is needed. And you have to do the same thing with your parents, with your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your nieces, your nephews. You have to do the same thing with them to break them from out of this spell. i give you another good example. I was in Taco Bell one time. Give me a um, bean burrito, me and my man Mike. We sat down. Two young ladies came to us and started talking to us, and my man Mike, you know, started talking to them and building with them. Christian dude comes up to us. He sees us talking. He interrupts the conversation, all right, and he starts talking about white Jesus. Now, <laughs> I already had a problem with that, number one. Um, he interrupted the conversation. Number two, he coming in and talking about white Jesus. So he comes in, and he just, you know, I have you know, uh, the Lord died for your sins. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Um, bro, come in. And so I take him, you know, over to, you know, in front of the store. And I say this real loud to embarrass him and make him think. I said, um, Jesus Christ died for your sins? Oh, yes, yes. And Jesus Christ is God? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And Jesus Christ, when he died for your sins, he went to hell for three days and three nights, right? Oh, yes, 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 he sure did. I said, mm. And so while he was down there in hell for three days and three nights, he was down there in order to get the keys of hell and death from Satan, right? Oh, yes, that's what the Bible says. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, while wow, Jesus was down there fucking around with Satan for three days and three nights, then who the fuck was controlling the universe? da da Nigga stood there with his mouth open for about 20 seconds or so, and everybody in Taco Bell laughed at him. You can hear the workers in the back, the cooks, um, uh, front registers, clerks, as well as white folks, and everybody sitting in the room who was eating, who heard it, was laughing loud. Because your doctrine don't make sense. And if you're not trying to think, then that's what's going to happen. You're going to with me. Because I'm going to make you think about your doctorate to seminary, I mean, um, for the tech school. I've been ordained five times as a minister, a pastor, a preacher. Don't never get caught up into these doctrines, sex code schisms and isms. Never. You are God. Plain and simple. All right. You go to First Corinthians three sixteen. Do you not know that your body is the temple of God? Luke seventeen twenty one. The kingdom of God is within you. So when you start looking at the things within, then you don't have a problem. The problem comes in when you take all your energy and focus on something external of yourself, such as a painting or a picture or a portrait of white Jesus. And so now you have transformed all the energy that you produce into this thought form based on this image. And this now becomes your idol. And now the God within you is now a jealous God because you're not using the powers in which that God gave you. You've taken all of your talent and you have produced this thought form so that millions and billions of people can worship. And this is how they now stay in power. It's based on the aspect of this fellow Willie Lynch or Kingu or Leviathan, as Dr. York spoke about. Because they are using they are using your energies in the process. And that is the Antichrist. Anything that you worship outside of yourself and you're not developing your Christ is the Antichrist. Point blank. That's what that is. So um, get your parents and your brothers and sisters from out of their anti-Christness, 
or their anti crisis or their crisis, all right? Get them up out of that so they can really know what's really going on. And start insulting their intelligence, especially the ones who think that they are so intelligent and got PhDs. And this is how we rectify this situation or this uh, matter. Don't let them get away with um, saying dumb shit. All right? So let me get back into the discussion. Sorry for going off on a tantrum, but all of this is part of um, the benefits in which that comes and the healing effects that comes from the whole back techniques because, like we said, at 10, the man becomes completely psychic and very spiritual. And since the pineal gland is fully activated and energized at that point, um, he now has communication to the ancestors on which he can tap into the Akashic Records or tap into the Universal Library in order to find out everything which I'm saying is true, no longer having to depend upon um, an image to dictate um, his destiny in life. I'm not realizing that he's acting as the Antichrist, putting forth all his energy onto something in which that doesn't exist and never existed, but he made it to appear to be. All right, this is the nonsense that's taking place. So, um, you have to have the right concepts even when you're in the act. All right, if you go to the um, Yin Lung, um, Pi Chun, from the um, Dark Child and the Yellow Emperor. In the book, it says if a man engaged in sex act just once without emitting semen, then his vital essence will become strong. If he does so twice, his hearing and vision will become clear. If three times, all bodily disease will disappear. If four times, then inner peace will become attached to his spirit. If five times, then blood circulation will become greatly improved. If six times, his loins will become very strong. If seven times, his thighs and buttocks will increase power. If eight times, his whole body will become shining and radiate. If nine times, his life expectancy will increase. So. This is what happens when you learn the science of the whole back technique, all right? And you can um, also get information from Manti Chia's book, The Multi-Orgasmic Man, um, as well as also from the sexual reflexology of Manti Chia. Um, the number one book, of course, on which that I recommend people to get is my teacher's book, Sanyata Saraswati, um, Jewel and the Lotus, all right? So um, you're going to come on back with questions and answers in the second part here. All right. So um, I think we had a call. Let's see here. Area code 336, you're on the line. 336. Peace. 336, you're on the air. Peace. All right, area code three three six. You on the air? Yeah, you said it was. Uh, what was the name of that book again? Which one? Jewel and the Lotus. Jewel. Jewel. J e w e l. Jewel and the Lotus. By Sanyata Saraswati. Sanyata spelled S U N Y A T A. Sanyata, and then Saraswati, S-A-R-A-S-W-A-T-I, Saraswati. Okay. And um, the, uh, can you uh, touch up on the uh, concept of the tri- triple blackness one more game for me? Yeah. Um, in the um, Holy Quran, it says that man comes from out of triple stage darkness, which is talking about the three trimester periods of the woman. While the child is inside of the womb, you had the first trimester, which is three months, the second trimester, which is three months, and the third trimester, which is three months. And, of course, oh. three times three is nine. Okay. So here's the nine months of birth. So here's as the child goes into the 10th month or the 40th week, you know, the child comes forth. You know what I'm saying? 40 symbolizes the age of spiritual maturity. This is why... Um, it rained 40 days and 40 nights with Noah, or Jesus had to fast 40 days and 40 nights, or Moses, um, you know, uh, received um, 40 years after he left Egypt, 
you know, 40 years exactly after he left Egypt, he received the Ten Commandments. Okay. Or um, Muhammad received at the age of 40 the Holy Quran. So the number 40 symbolizes spiritual maturity as well as also physical maturity. Okay, okay. And within the ancient Egyptian um, walls and halls of um, Hakka, which is um, the ancient mystery school, you had to study 40 years. Okay. Okay. And I just want to let people know about the uh, spring equinox in Winston. Yeah. It's coming up. Let everybody everybody know about that, man. Oh, yeah. Well, we have the uh, spring equinox coming up um, outside of uh, Winston-Salem. It's going to be on the land. On um, 400 and some odd acres, um, Brother Emmanuel will be um, doing his thing there this weekend coming up. Uh, for those who are near um, North Carolina or Virginia area, come on out. Or uh, even further out, come on and um, celebrate this um, with the brothers and sisters there this weekend, um, specifically um, Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm through with my question, man. All right, bro. Peace. I appreciate that. Hotel. Hotel. All right, area code three two one. Area code three two one. You're on the line. Area code three two one. Yeah, hello. Yes, Pete. How you doing? How you doing? Good. Yes. Uh, there's, there's this issue about uh, my neck, right? I, I heard you one one time you were talking about how uh, certain aspects of the neck represents the, uh, the mouth of God, right? See, right? You said certain what now? Uh, I think uh, certain aspect, uh, the mouth of God, what do you call that again? Where is oh, that located? Yeah, at the back of the head is called the medulla amagata. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right, right. within Hebrew is called go, Q-O-P-H, go, which is one of the letters of the 22 letters of the Hebrew script. But go means monkey, copy, axe, all right? and skull yeah. or back of the head. So um, that symbolizes, the, it also means the mouth of God. So the medulla amagata means the mouth of God. And that is one of the places in which that the soul enters in at, um, the soul can enter in at the top of the head, there at the um, medulla amagata, um, as well as other places the soul can enter in at, depending on the person's consciousness at the formation of the physical body. All right. In other words, that consciousness is also based on their parents and seven generations on the mother's side and seven generations on the father's side, um, in which that the soul um, enters at specifically in one of the body areas. Um, the medulla amagata also is the place of your past lives, so that's where your past lives are located at, as well as also your photographic memory. Um, in ancient times, they would tap the area, actually in Qigong and Tai Chi, um, and the yogi traditions, they still do it today. They'll tap that area 25 times, three times a day in order to scar that area, in order to develop photographic memory and give you access to your past lives or your prior incarnations into the oversoul. Your oversoul is the storage place of your past life. Well, yeah, I, I, to, to verify what you're saying, that actually happened to me. And uh, I was doing a ritual to certain energies certain things kept happening to me and I didn't understand why these things were happening. So I tried, I, kn- I know the ritual of communicating with the past life. And when I did it, it my, the back of my neck felt like it's, it got hard all of a sudden, like mm-hmm. real, real hard, like real hard. Like it was like someone was like stretching it or pulling it. It, it just felt heavy. Right. I don't know what you can say about that. It just felt strange. Like it was like someone was pulling on it, like pulling, pulling on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, normally when a person is getting mounted by a spirit, um, it starts at the head or neck area. So, um, especially at the back of the head. So, um, as you was doing the ritual, a spirit could have possibly been trying to um, enter access through the mouth of God in order to communicate with you. Wow. Yeah, I kind of. I mean, it got kind of scary. So how long? Because it, it got kind of long. It, it it didn't really last long. But I I, I keep, sometimes when I try to communicate with spirits, I I finally give up because I get like this like distracted and like 
I don't feel like it anymore, you know, or, you know what I'm saying? So, right. I don't, yeah, but yeah, definitely, when I was communicating, trying to do the ritual, that's, it, it, in the back of my neck, just felt, I just felt a lot of pressure right. in the back of my neck, a lot of pressure. Right. So, so if I feel that, just keep it going, right? Um, you can if you want the spirit to um enter in and contact and communicate with you. But um, personally, I would tell the spirit just um communicate with me via um mentally through through um telepathic. It's not necessary to enter into my body in order to convey a message. Okay. You know, so right. um, you can do that, too, as a form of protection. If you need to, garb yourself in white or either go light, you know, um, because you don't know what spirit it could have been. And um, you can say prior to um, doing a ritual, make sure you encase a circle around you as a circle of protection um, before you do any ritual, all right? Okay. Um, so yeah. that the spirit, you know, that only a good spirit can enter through that gate, um, gateway, you know, that negative spirits will have to stay out, you know. So um, you have to do those types of things in order to, to um, prepare yourself for a ritual, okay? Indeed, indeed. I truly appreciate that. All right, brother. You should, you, yeah, thank you. All right, peace. All right. So um, let's get back into the discussion. Now, for those who understand what the Kundalini is, um, a universal name or universal consciousness is Shakti, all right, or Shitti, all right. Um, she's the great black mother goddess principle, all right. She's symbolic to noon or the dark matter or melanin in a sense, all right. Um, the name in ancient Egypt would be also not noon, just noon, but or new, but or said also. That's where you get the concept of the black Madonna and child from, all right. And, um, the child is called Heru Saaset. This is where the baby Jesus comes from in the New Testament and Mary. Mary happened to be one of the names of all set. Instead of M-A-R-Y, it was M-E-R-I. And the Catholic Church took M-E-R-I, which is all set Mary, dropped all set, but kept that Mary was the Queen of Heaven and then made statues of the black Madonna and child, which they have now throughout over 200 countries, in which that these European um, bishops um, worship around the world. Even the Pope has, in the bottom of the Vatican, a black Madonna and child, which he goes down to and worship. This was shown in a Jet magazine years ago when Pope Paul, um, John Pope Paul II was alive. All right, so... Um, that black Madonna and child symbolized that spirit and that soul that resonate together at the base of the spine, all right? And at that particular place, the spirit overshadows the soul, called the soul as a baby at that time and needs protection and nurturing, all right? So... Um, the Kundalini didn't create the universe the way that human a human being builds a house, which is using different kinds of material and remaining different from those materials. No, she creates the universe or the universe from out of her own being, and it is she herself who becomes the universe. She becomes all the elements, earth, air, water, and fire, or when they combine, ether. She becomes all the um, elements on the periodical chart. She enters into all of the different forms that we see around us. She becomes the sun, the moon, the star, all right? She becomes everything she creates. She is Prada or Chia Ki or the Holy Spirit, the universal life force, or the supreme energy that animates all living things. She is Eve of your Bible, the mother of all living things. It's she who quenches your thirst by becoming water. To satisfy your hunger, she becomes food. Whatever appears tangible or is intangible, physical or spiritual, is nothing but shitty or nothing but the Kundalini. She enters everything she creates. But yet, at the same time, she never loses her identity or her immaculate purity, which is her virginity. This is where uh, Mother Mary um, is the virgin comes in at. He's talking about the Kundalini. All right? She can be 
um, Mary Magdalene, the harlot, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, the virgin. When she's the harlot, meaning that she's in her creation mode of making things into existence. When she's the um, virgin, then she um, realized the things in which that she made into existence. This is what um, it means. You know, she entered into um, the cells or the atoms, the subatomic atoms, the quarks, you know, the uh, the molecules, the cells of your body. You know what I'm saying? First Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, and therefore glorify God in your body. Second Corinthians um, 6, 16, 8, therefore you are the temple of the living God, you know, and I will dwell in them, and they shall be my sons and my daughters. That is that is the God in which that they are referred to, is the Kundalini. So, being that she becomes the element what we was talking about earlier is that you as a melanated being, you absorb the elements, you absorb the star particles, or what is called um, stardust particles or stardust energy. You absorb that prana or that chi or key energy, that Holy Spirit. And you store that energy into you, to, um, especially at the base of the spine, behind the navel chakra, in order to create longevity, even immortality. If you put it in the heart, then... Um, you create love. If you put it in your third eye, then you create high intelligence or high IQ, as they say, and creativity. So these are the things in which that um, must be mastered. So you are drawing in the life force energy. You're drawing in the mother goddess principle when you do Reiki, when you do Qigong, Tai Chi, Pranayama, or Pranic Healing, as it is called. Anytime that you work with the life principle, then you're drawing in that energy, whether it's descending energy or ascending energy. You're working with that particular energy of life. Right. So, um, in the movie Matrix, Morpheus showed Neo a Doris or battery. And he um, remembers um, Morpheus told Neo that this is all the author that come out to the machine. Well, it's true that we are a battery, and the battery needs to be alkaline. And when the battery is alive, the output in electrical charge is alkaline. But when it is dead, it's aesthetic. So um, our bodies is about 25% acidic and 35% alkaline. So it's recommended that we consume roughly 25% acidic food and 75% alkaline food. As also our bodies are 75% water and 25% mass. So when the body is too acidic, you feel ill, sick, and suffer from ailments and disease. So you have to learn how to um, get alkaline water um, and foods because they're electrical. They give you that electrical um, connection. And right now in the third dimension, another thing is only a semiconductor. This is why we're going up in two dimensions from the fourth into the fifth dimension right now. As we move from out the dark rift into the outer armband, um, the inner arm band, excuse me, of the um, photon belt, um, closer to the um, central sun called Alcyon, in which that, um, at that point, we were moved from length, width, and height, which is the third dimension, to depth, which is dealing with time and space, which is the fourth dimension, to energy, which is the fifth dimension. And alkalinity helps with that transition. Right, these are some more codes that you need when it comes to the science of regeneration. All right. Sex also happens at the cellular level. Remember, that's how you got here. It was through cellular division. Right, so that means that is a way in order to make sure that your cells or purify enough to carry an electrical, um, to be con- to have that conductivity. That conductivity is what helps with the um, with the energy transferring. Vitamin B6, B12, B2 in particular is what is used 
has the vitamin in order to transform the food in which that you eat into energy for the cell. As a matter of fact, those same vitamins help cleanse the melanin, along with chlorophyll and green leafy vegetables. All right, you get the book, Melanin, The um, Chemical Key to Greatness, to Black Greatness by Carol Barnes. Because melanin can be viewed as a battery that is partially charged. All right? The more energy in which that comes in, which is ultraviolet light, the more it becomes a superconductor. This is why they're trying to cut off um, the energy from coming in. They're putting all this chemtrails or this aluminum up in the sky to cut down, which act as a reflective agent to cut down on the energies coming in. The solar phatic energy or the solar flare or the CMEs, coronal mass ejection. But anyway, um, melanin is a battery that can always be charged. You know, when sunlight or other energies come in contact with the melanin battery, it increases the charge of the battery to a, to a certain degree. When the energy is captured, the battery has more energy to use in the body. This means that the human being can actually um, charge up their melanin process, you know, processes, and, you know, they have this unique ability to absorb various energy sources and convert those absorbed energies into reusable energy. This includes musical vibrations, sound waves, uh, sun rays, heat, etc. And this is what I was saying before about Dr. Frank Barr. Um, in his theory, he said matter is shaped and structured by light, and that these molecules, combinations, or molecular combinations, eat light in order to maintain, expand, and evolve matter. What is these molecular combinations? It's melanin, carbon. So the more highly evolved a species, the more complex its biological capacity is to use light. All right? Now, um, melanin is the perfect superconductor or the absorber of light and all the um, energy frequencies, especially when it comes into ultraviolet light frequency, which is actually dealing with the fourth dimension. And higher. You know, according to all the indigenous people around the world, whether it's the Aborigines or the Africans or the Native Americans, they all speak about the fact of the earth going into the fifth world. So hence, it would be a new heaven and new earth. You know, Melican rearranges chemical structure to absorb all energy across the energy spectrum. You know, and then you know, transmute and store this energy for later use. So it can use radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, um, ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays. Use all seven of these um, spectrums, electromagnetic spectrums. All right? Now, this is the key tool that we was talking about Um when you go to the visible spectrum rays that deals with the third dimension, we spoke about the fact of using the various colors to be able to project, to be projected, especially during the sexual um, act or the intimacy um, upon your partner. Like if they need a healing, um, whatever they might need. Um, like, for example, the color red. Um, man evolved from the color red. This is how we got it. This is why color, my blood is the color red and, and so forth and so on. Well, we have a reddish tint that symbolizes the fact of the red aura in the case of strong sexual force that also um, awakens our physical life force. It strengthens our overall energy level. It attracts, magnetizes, um, stimulates, and energizes. All right, so you can use that color and project it on the person. All right, it stimulates the liver, um, the automatic nervous system, and the circulatory system. Orange is real good um, for life, most healing conditions such as stomach, um, the large or small intestine, the pancreas, the spleen, you know, um, thyroid glands, you know, adrenal glands, etc. It's good for the um, lip, for the um, lungs also, for the respiratory. So you, if a person has um, lung issues, you can actually visualize orange light in the lungs. 
You know, yellow is good for um, the digestive system, the lymphatic system, the gallbladder and bladder and the nerves. You know, it opens and activates the left hemisphere of the brain. And it's an excellent overall healing color. Green is real good. It balances the energy. It heals all heart ailments, increases the circulatory system, um, stimulates the um, pituitary gland, it raises the vibration um, of the physical body above the vibration of disease. And it heals all um, infections and builds cells and tissue. Green is the color of healing, you know what I'm saying, and growth. Now, you don't use green if you have cancer. You use blue instead. All right, in particular, um, a light blue, all right? Now, um, when you're speaking about blue, blue is real good for vitality. Um, it's good for um, healing um, ailments the respiratory system, the throat, nose, ears, and eyes. It acts as an antibiotic, you know. Um, it's real good for all childhood diseases. It strengthens the communication with relationships. It's also used for astral projection, and it induces actually for um, prophetic dreams, all right? Indigo is real good. It helps with hormonal um, imbalances and bring the endocrine gland system back into balance, as well as both hemispheres of the brain. It acts as antibiotic also, and it's real good as an excellent blood purifier. It stops hemorrhaging. So any internal bleeding from the tissues or organs or nosebleeds, you will actually project the indigo color upon a person, all right? It depresses the heart, shrinks the um, enlarged heart, as well as also it um, lowers the blood pressure. It awakens the gift of intuition. Violet, which is purple, is good as an antibiotic also. It acts on the nerves, the heart, the lymphatic system, and overall parts of the body. It's a good color for expansion in all forms, love, health, business, which is wealth. The color of violet offers the gift of spiritual protection, knowledge of the higher realms of magic, to become one with your highest potential, which is your higher self, and an enhancement of the food. Um, of your prophetic powers, all right? So these are the meanings behind it. Now, that's in the third dimension. Melanin is a semiconductor. However, when it comes to contact with ultraviolet light, all right, the sun is the source of ultraviolet light. So this is why you as a melanin being need at least an hour of sunlight a day. And ultraviolet radiation is black light, all right? And melanin becomes a superconductor of electromagnetic energy and increases the person's sensitivity to the um, ethic beings or the spiritual entities in the higher worlds through its contact with ultraviolet light. So that means that it's the light of the sun in which that produces or gives you the ability in order to store up enough energy so when you go to sleep at night, the melatonin can flow in order to produce lucid dreams which is also based on the production of DMT. All right? So um, this is what melanin does. And this is very important for you to understand that um, as a melanated being, you read a book called The Science of Melanin, Dispelling a Myth by T. Owens Moore. T. Owens, that's O-W-E-N-S, T. Owens, and then Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Ph.D. All right, you get another book called The Onk, The African Origin of um, Electromagnetism. All right, it's written by um, Nur Onk Amin, by the um, Hiru Samaj, um, the wife of, um, um, he's married to um, Queen of Four. And what the book says is talking about um, as a semiconductor, melanin has an energy gap in it what I was talking about, and that the absorption of this energy is required before electrons can jump into conductive band and make melanin conductive. An increase in, con- in conductivity increases the sensitivity of melanin to the electromagnetic worlds of etheric beings, astral projections, and spiritual entities. All right, at low frequencies, the conductivity of melanin is small. 
but at ultra high frequencies, which dealing with ultraviolet light, melanin is a superconductor. Maximum current flows only on the skin due to the skin effects at melanin ultra high frequencies, the resonant frequencies. So melanin is the most important substance in the body for the spiritual connection. All right? So that means that the more ultraviolet light that comes in, the stronger your melanin is in order to reach into the astral plane and to the spiritual and the contact spiritual entity to communicate with the day and have out of body experiences, astral projections or soul travels. The science of sex is being able to release all it is at the point of orgasm. Your communication with the astral being. You becoming more intuitive. You becoming more sensitive. You opening and projecting. Um, in what we were talking about earlier, in sexual magic, um, you being to project the thought in order to resonate back to you like a boomerang effect. All right. Oh, let me see if he has another question here. All right. The question is, um, what if you're a female and have no partner? Um, do you use tantric or sexual magic? What you would use actually is masturbation. When you masturbate, you can still produce the same um, power as in a sexual act, especially if you're circulating the energy and doing the whole back techniques, all right? Now, for a woman, her whole back techniques come in at, with the science of or orgasm, there's like nine different levels of orgasm for the woman, all right? Now, in that, this is what normally will happen. Now, when you go to it, you see, normally, there's certain things in which that take place at the first level, all right? At the first level, um, there's certain things in which that the energy begin to start flowing and it activates her lungs, all right? So at the first level of female orgasm, it activates her lungs. The woman sighs and breathes heavily and salivates. Two, um, her heart become energized. All right, and the woman, while kissing um, the man, extends the tongue. In which that, if she don't have a partner, um, she don't. She'll circulate the energy up from the perineum or G spot area up the, to the top of her head, up the front of her body, down the back, and she'll circulate the energy seven times to activate the lungs. She gets to the point of orgasm also. And at two, she'll do the whole back technique to stimulate the heart. At three, she'll do it in order to stimulate the pancreas and the stomach and the spleen. At four, the kidneys and the bladder. Five, the bones. Six, the liver and the nerves. Seven, the blood. Um, Eight, the muscles. At nine, the entire body is energized. All right? So um, she can do it during those levels of orgasm. All right? And she can take herself through those nine levels. So um, even if the woman doesn't have a partner, she can do the same thing as the man does in the old back technique, as well as the man can too, in which that um, energy um, it's for a man, goes up the spine, down the front. For the woman, goes up the front and down the spine. All right? And she can do the whole back thing. So it can, like, she can masturbate to the point of when she's getting ready to orgasm and stop and draw the energy up the front and down the spine, up the front and down the spine, and then start up the experience again. And she can try to get as high as she can in those levels. And she really energize and revitalize and rejuvenate and regenerate herself in that manner too. 
So um, these are the things in which that takes place. All right. So um, she can also use text magic if she chooses to to project what she wants into um, into um, existence too. If she chooses to. Okay. That's what goes on. All right, let me see here. I think that was the only question. Yes, that was the name of the book. Is Jewel in the Lotus, The Tantric Path to Higher Consciousness by Sanyata Saraswati. Yes, that is the name of the book. All right. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, um, so what is the name of that technique? Oh, you're welcome. It's the whole back technique in which that... um. Like we were saying, um, while masturbating, this goes for the man or woman. They can get to the point of orgasm to about 90-some-odd percent. Stop, pull up your anal muscles and perineum, in particular the woman's G-spot, and draw the energy for the woman up the front of the spine. I mean, excuse me, up the front of the body to the top of the head and down the spine and circulate the energy seven times in that manner. Then start um, masturbating again. The man, he would pull up his anal muscles and perineum um, at the 90-some-odd percent and circulate energy up his spine and down his back, up the spine and down the front seven times before he, um, and, you know, the longer he can do his whole back technique, the stronger his body becomes energetic. And then um, on the last, the ninth and the tenth, um, or tenth back technique, then you can orgasm. All right, and by doing so, um, you have already rejuvenated your body, so you don't have to worry about the loss of any um, life force at that particular time period. Okay? So these are some of the clues. All right? Now, you talked about this before, about the women's orgasm, and... You know, but I talked about this on here, but I definitely talked about it. I had so many shows this past week, it's ridiculous. But anyway, um, at the fourth level of what we was talking about, the woman can vaginal or um, 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 vaginal climax or orgasm, but it's at the ninth level of orgasm, which that she actually skeet, 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 as they would say, which that she can gush as much as a cup and a half to two cups of fluid while ejaculating. Women, that's where you want to get to because that produces a full-body orgasm. And this is based on how hydrated the woman is at the time when this occurs, all right? And most women don't know that they can do it. It's because they normally think that they have to urinate in the process, all right? But it's not urination. If you just let go, then you would see that um, there's a chemical similarity between um, the orgasm because they both, your urine and the orgasm both come out to your urethra. So they both come out the same area. You know what I'm saying? So there is a similarity in substance, but um, the orgasm is not pee or urine. All right? So um, these are just things that needs to be known particularly. All right? Uh, matter of fact, um, scientists found that the fluid contains levels of glucose, sugar, enzymes, which is prosthetic um, acid, which is the same characteristic of medical component in semen, all right, or prosthetic fluid. Um, and there's two other substances that's contained in the fluid, which is commonly found in urine, which is urea and creatine, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but this is a unique substance, and unlike the heavier and thicker fluid that we typically see in a woman's um, um, who is wet or who had a vaginal orgasm. All right, that that particular orgasm is excreted from the skinny glands and the Bartholian glands, which are sits at the anterior and the posterior um, entrance of the labia, which is the lips of the um, vagina. All right, but this orgasm at the ninth level, women, happens from the urethra, which is the same as the pee hole. And that produces a 
cup and a half to two cups of fluid in which that, brothers, um, that is the fluid in which that you will actually intake in order to rejuvenate the life force. Um, in ancient times, the Gnostics actually would um, mix certain alchemical properties together, menses, uh, semen, um, um, the orgasm or of the woman in order to rejuvenate them. So that was called the elixir of life, all right? All of this, of course, was different rituals and different ceremonies. You can actually get this from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from the Gnostic texts, all right? You get the um, Gnostic scriptures or the other Bible. It also speaks about these types of things also. So um, get into what was actually being practiced as a ritual in order to find out um, certain secrets in which that these higher societies still practice today. All right? Let me see if there's any questions. Um, we have a question, 313, area code 313, you're on the air. Hey, Ali. Peace. Uh, peace, this is Sonia. Um, I heard you speaking of color therapy. Is there a book that I can get on that? A what? Color. Using color. Color therapy. I'm yep. sorry, I didn't hear you. Therapy. You you was going in and out. I couldn't hear you. The book color therapy. The who? Color therapy. I didn't hear the first. I'm sorry. I you were going in and out. The color. The color therapy is the name of the book? Color therapy, yes. Oh. Who is that by? That's the actual name of the book. I can't remember the author right now, but that's the name of the book. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I needed. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Peace. Peace. All right. Let's go. See what's in the chat. If there's any questions, okay, question from chat. To explain the Shakti or role of Mary Magdalene. Oh, all right. In light of the holy orgasm, if you didn't already. All right. Well, real simple. Um, the Kundalini Shakti is Mary Magdalene, as I said, the harlot. As the harlot um, uses elements, as the harlot uses man or the thoughts of man in order to create what she wanted to existence. Well, the Kundalini Shakti uses um the science of thought also in order to form tangible things into existence. So in that role, the Kundalini Shakti is known as the harlot, which, of course, we know Jesus married um, Mary Magdalene, according to the scriptures, all right? Um, and also according to um, so-called philosophers or theologians and um, biblical scholars, okay? Um the Kundalini Shakti is um, the light in which that is produced from the holy orgasm. You have certain um, byproducts in which that takes place. All right, as we just finished talking about was the, um, the orgasmic fluid of the women. All right, that is the byproduct of the release of Mary Magdalene or the Kundalini energy in the body during the orgasmic experience. Hence the holy orgasm. Where holy means sun or light, orgasmic means like the Big Bang, all right, or what produced life in existence, you know. So these are just simply the keys in which that is um, talked about um, in those particular um, aspects. Exactly. Thank you for the color therapy book. There it is right there. All right. Um, hopefully, um, I don't know if. You got it, Sonia, but it's by R.B. Amber, A-M-B-E-R, R.B. Amber, um, is the author of The Color Therapy. All right, thank you, um, um, Ninty. Uh, let me see here. Is, is any other, oh, did I answer that question too, Ninty? I don't know if I did. Did I, did I answer that? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so um, let me see here. We got about 12 more minutes. 
before we head out. Um, I'm going to play another song, come back, and then see if there's any other questions before we get on the, oh, okay, we got a question all right. Let me go to the line, 773, 773, you're on the line. Hey, how's it going, babe? Peace. Hey, um, I got a question. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of methods coming out right now. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you choose which one to do? I mean, it's like, you know, you you do this, do that. You know, this this teacher got something, this teacher got something. How you do, do them you all. You, you do them all and see which one works the best for you. Nobody can determine what works best for you. You have to experiment and try them all. That's the point of life is experiment. That's, what, that's why they call it experiment. Experiences or experience. What should be the what, what should be the end goal? What should we experience or what should we? I mean, how should that, we feel? That's just, the end goal is the full activation of your kundalini energy. But one hundred percent usage of the energy in your body, usage of your brain, usage of being able to tap into the universe, usage of your DNA. No longer just being dormant at ten percent. Ten percent usage of your brain. Ten percent usage of your DNA. Ten percent usage of being able to tap into the universe. Who want that? You know, who want to be limited like that? You want to be able to have access to 100% of everything. And so um, the criteria is being able to open and activate yourself, and you do that through the practice of um, whether what school it comes from, regardless, you practice all of it and see what works for you. Then you put together your own program, and you do it on a daily basis. Just that simple. Okay, thanks, man. All right. All right. Um, we had a question in the chat room. It was asking about the um, how to get um, their counterpart into Qigong. Well, there's many facets of Qigong. You had the move, the moving Qigong, in which that I mean, there's two particular types of Qigong. You have the um, the way down Qigong and the knee knee down um, Qigong, in which that deals with moving, and one that deals with sitting. Or standing still. Um, either or is the way in which that you get them into a day or get both they actually do some type of, um, you know, exercise on a daily basis. And of course, um, you can do um, the way down, you know, which that is very um, good for a person who wants to move. So that moves into the cheek on into. Tai Chi, the Adonai Gong, in which that does go sit in and just move energy through um, your body. You know, it can be in the form of meditation, like meditation, or actual just light movement, you know, um, sitting or standing, in which that does go to moving up that energy. So it depends on the way in which that the person feels, all right, and that's something in which that you push them into. But it definitely is something in order to make them understand. So in order to first get them to understand, I mean, give them some type of information on that they can read, in which that is comprehensible, in which that puts them into that type of arena, you know, as far as the understanding of it, you know, because most people die for a lack of knowledge. So a lot of things that we do not know, this is why we lack in the world in almost everything, um, in every facet of society, and why we laughed at um you know, in the sense on the planet, but yet everyone knows who's the most creative people are. But we are shut off from our creativity um, because it has always been trying to be controlled by others. You know, as you reap the benefits from it, in which that they normally reap the benefits and we get from it. There's nothing for it at all. So, um, Qigong helps tap you into those different creative energy. So, you might want to explain it from that. Get online and go to um, every years on YouTube clips in which that they practice Qigong or Tai Chi and just practice it with, with them on a daily basis if that's possible. You know, make it as part of a curriculum you know, for, you, uh, for, you know, for yourself in order to see how, uh, you know, how that is. You know, so that's, you know, what I suggest. All right? If there's some more questions, let's get up off of here. Um, I don't see any more questions. So what you're getting ready to do is um, head on out, and um, we're going to talk to you all next week. All right, so come on back and check us out. First World Order Radio, finally. 
Finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that Buddha consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. And others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works.